Okay, Mr. Hilsinger? Here. Mr. Sneed? Here. Ms. Hart? Here. Mr. Cunningham? Here. Mr. Taylor? Here. Mr. Elliott? Here. Mr. Lawler? Here. Okay, we have seven. Seven, yes. Um, we have meeting summary minutes from executive meeting. April 20th, need a motion to accept. So moved. Motion to accept. Second. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it 7 0. Next, we have uh, Planning Commission status sheet. Need a motion to accept. Make a motion. Accept. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it 7 0. We have no committee reports. So we'll go to the first item, which is PC. 02-23 Ameren. Good evening. The PC 2-23 Ameren requested a conditional user permit in the R2 residential district to build a proposed 91 foot monofall style wireless telecommunication tower on a 1.2 acre track located on west of Telegraph Road, approximately 635 feet south of Yeager Road. The site is located in South County and it is outlined in red on the aerial. According to the aerial, the subject site is located in the commercial corridor of the Telegraph Road. From the Preliminary site development plan, you can see that the proposed yeah. tower will coexist with the existing Ameren electric substation. The tower will be approximately 300 feet away from the R2 residential property line, and it will be oh, yeah. enclosed with a six foot tall side proof decorative fence. Additionally, I also would like to state that uh, Missouri Uniform uh, Wireless Telecommunication Infrastructure Deployment Act prohibits local government from require an applicant to give information about design services, customer demand for service, or quality of its service to or from an area, impose uh, requirements regarding the appearance of towers, including the types of material used and the screen in all landscaping materials used that are unreasonable. The Telecommunication Act of 1996 bars states and municipalities from basing uh, the regulation of a facility on the basis of the environmental effects, including health effects of its emissions. That's my memory. Why do we even bring this up if, if it's it's automatic? They're going to get it anyway. The department recommends approval for this request, and uh, we believe that the conditional user procedure, uh, user permit procedure is appropriate for this request. Uh, however, the department finds that uh, barbed wire is not appropriate on the residential zone parcel nor along a ma uh, major commercial corridor and recommends prohibiting the material additionally uh, the department also recommends uh, appropriate landscaping okay mr. Pelzinger, i just want to note that mr bedell has uh come onto the meeting so i've noted his attendance. okay so we have eight Okay, with that, we need a motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. I think Jerry had a question. Yeah, to Mr. Elliott's point, um, the way that the zoning ordinance is still constructed right now, since the use is listed as a conditional use, they they wouldn't be able to pull a building permit without a conditional use permit. Um, so it is a little odd that, you know, these state regulations, the federal regulations don't quite align with, with what our zoning ordinance says. Um, but it boils down to essentially we haven't updated the zoning ordinance to reflect what these two uh, acts 
limit us to do. Yeah, well, federal law trumps state and county law last time I checked. So. Has this been challenged anywhere in the state? That's a good question, Mr. Hilsinger. Um, I am unaware of um, which, if any specific cases challenging this. However, um, you know, it is always the sort of the purview of the planning commission to um, perhaps hold uh, a, an issue and, and to request a, a closed session to, to receive legal advice around um, any of those questions. And I'm sure Mr. Burford, who is on uh, on the call, um, could um, at some point, if it was the commission's desire, uh, provide some um, closed session uh, legal advice pertaining to to that question. Okay. Uh, anyone else have anything to add? Seeing none, we have a motion to accept uh, all those in favor. Aye. Opposed. Let the record show eight with none opposed. And we'll go on to PC 12 23. Good evening, commissioners. Before you see PC 12 23, Azra Selimovich, the request is for an amended C8 uh, to permit a tattoo parlor in all C2 shopping district permitted uses. It's on a tract of 1.84 acres on the south side of Hee Road and the west side of Mackenzie Road. You can see on the left that this is in South County. Um, and on the right, you'll see an area, aerial, excuse me, with the site outlined in red. From the larger aerial, you can note that uh, the site is located on the corner of Mackenzie and Higi Roads. This is uh, a copy of the preliminary site development plan. Uh, the entire uh, multi-tenant commercial building is outlined in red. Um, it's about a 17,000 square foot commercial building. For uh, the petitioner's use, it's going to be in the 1,320 square foot storefront, which is that uh, orange box with the red arrow. Uh, no exterior site improvements were proposed on the preliminary site development plan and parking requirements are met. The proposed hours of the uh, petitioner's tat hypothetical tattoo parlor are from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Sunday. <clears throat> The department is recommending approval. The department believes that the C8 plan commercial district remains appropriate for this site um, and notes the expanding commercial uses on this location over the course of a few decades. Um, and this trend was actually noted um, as a positive um, development by the Afton Community Plan Progress Report which was published in 2007. Um, and the department believes that a modest sized tattoo parlor is appropriate for this location and would note that until 1998, tattoo parlors were permitted by right in the C2 shopping district um, and currently are permitted via conditional use permit. Um, and so the department thinks that the C8 plan commercial district procedure provides the um, requisite oversight for a, a use like this. Um, and now I would request a motion. Okay, we need a motion. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Discussion. One question about um, the C2 that we're um, looking at approving. Does that include packaged liquor or would they need a conditional use permit for a packaged liquor? So the request is for a C8 planned commercial district and what frequently will be requested or recommended is a full range of uses from one of the districts. So what was written for the C8 um, before, before this petition was basically all C2 uses, which would include packaged liquor. Um, 
there were a couple that were called out as prohibited uh, parole office. Peter, I think there was one more use that was prohibited, but we, we recommended is the same sort of range plus a tattoo parlor. So yes, a packaged liquor store, if it met the 1000 foot buffer from another packaged liquor store would be permitted in the C8 if, if it was approved by, you know, the, the commission and the council. Um, if there was another existing package liquor store within a thousand feet, no one would be able to open one here. And as a reminder, it's only a package liquor store if the sales, um, if over two thirds of the sales come from the sale of alcohol. I just wanted to clarify from the previous meeting uh, discussion. So as written, if approved as recommended, they wouldn't, there would not need to be another planning commission action for a packaged liquor store to come into this site if it was a thousand feet away from another packaged liquor store. Do you have any restrictions on uh, signage for this? I believe they're, they would be getting signs per the C2, which is um, you would get 50 square feet for a pole sign, 75 square feet for a monument sign. I think I was talking, thinking more um, window signs. We've got one at um, Lindbergh and Lee May Ferry that's lit up like a Christmas tree. So we did not write in um, specific conditions about um, window or wall signage for this site, but if that's something the commission was interested in, we can certainly add that. Um, an example would be for the liquor store that was proposed at Telegraph and Pottle. We had added in uh, a recommended condition that no window signage be permitted. Um, so if that was something the commission was interested in, um, we could add that here. The rule for for uh, excuse me for window signage is that your window signs can't cover more than 50% of the window, but the commission could recommend prohibiting window signs altogether. Okay. Does it cover lighting though? And we could do a similar th for that for that proposed liquor store at, at, at Telegraph and Pottle as well. We did recommend prohibiting strip lighting, LED lighting around the windows. Um, if that's, you know, we could do, we could write that condition in as well. We could give it that same sort of treatment um, that we recommended for the liquor store. Is that okay with the first and second? I had Mr. Taylor as the first, and then I think I had Mr. Bedell as the second, but if I had that wrong, please let me know. So let me get this straight. If, if she walks, if, if, if this parlor shuts down, somebody can just put a liquor store in here, correct? If there was any vacancy in this in this development, and someone who operated a packaged liquor store wanted to occupy it, they would first, you know, submit a, a commercial reoccupancy to the Department of Public Works. Um, <clears throat> and in Public Works, they would verify with the licensing division whether or not that tract, and in that case, the door to that tenant space was within a thousand feet of another packaged liquor store. Um, so technically, the use is permitted, but there's other hoops they have to jump through. Um, and I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure where the closest package liquor store that that meets that definition is. But assuming there wasn't one, they could have one here, but it would meet all of the other requirements. If they did, right? And if it was, uh, you know, the commission's will, um, you could recommend prohibiting the sale of liquor, retail sale of liquor at this site. Very well, specific. Though. Let me. Go ahead, Jacob. I was going to say the current uses are C2 permitted uses. So, would a pack a package liquor store has been correct? Has been correct, permitted. Would have been permitted at this site for, for um, fifteen long, yeah. years. Yeah. Okay, I'll just hold with my, well, I'll hold with my motion then. Okay. Any other comments? So to confirm. Is the commission interested in additional conditions regarding window signage and 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 window border lighting? Um, motion. Go ahead. I was just asking, is the is that motion still on? And I was second it because if I'm second it, I, I'm okay with the uh, window lighting. Um, being prohibited. Being prohibited. 
um, if, if that motion is still is still up. Okay. <clears throat> what about Keith? You're the first. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go with that then. That they 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 can't have the uh, window light. Okay. Anyone else have anything to add? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it 8 0. And next we'll go to old business PC 38 22, Ameren. Good evening. PC 38 22, Ameren Tesson Ferry is a request for an amended mixed use development district governing a 0.6 acre tract on the west side of Tesson Ferry Road east side of Keller Road and northwest side of Brittinger Road. Uh, the commission will recall holding this petition at your January 9th, 2023 executive meeting for the department to gather some additional information, um, which I will overview momentarily. Uh, so, as you recall, this site is in South County. It is located in the southeastern corner of the Tesson Ridge um, development. Uh, well, the future site of the Tesson Ridge development um, off Tesson Ferry Road. This is the preliminary site development plan presented at public hearing. Um, it shows a 146 foot tall tower, um, which includes the height of the lightning rod. Uh, the tower area is enclosed by a six foot tall chain link fence with barbed wire. And the <laughs> location of the, the lease area is approximately 250 feet southwest of the closest proposed single family lot, um, which would be in the the Tesson Ridge development. The department is recommending that the tower site be screened with a six foot tall decorative site proof fence and appropriately landscaped. Um, we are also recommending that um, as much of the existing tree cover um, be preserved where possible. Um, and then we note that they will need to petition the Board of Zoning Adjustment for relief from the Southern setback requirement. Uh, the zoning ordinance requires that telecommunications towers be set back a distance equivalent to the height of the tower from any residentially zoned property. The parcel south of the petition site is zoned R2 residence district um, and the distance from the proposed tower to that property line is uh, 87.3 feet um, when 146 feet, which is the height of the tower, would be required. So, as Ashra just reminded you, and you're aware from previous petitions, uh, the Missouri Uniform Wireless Communication Infrastructure Deployment Act prohibits local jurisdictions from requiring some additional information about uh, service areas and from imposing requirements on the appearance of the tower, including height, and the Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996 bars local jurisdictions from regulating facilities based on health effects. This request was held at the January 9th executive meeting. At that meeting, the commission expressed concern about the proposed tower location within the Southern setback and requested information about alternate tower locations that meet the required setback, um, as well as clarification about future plans for co-location from this tower. The petitioner responded that the proposed location provides the desired coverage for the area um, and that the current tower is not designed for co-location. Uh, thus, the department is continuing to recommend approval of this request. Um, uh, we continue to find that the amended mixed use development district procedure is an appropriate mechanism to permit a telecommunications tower, and this will facilitate consistent zoning with the overall parent parcel. And we find that a telecommunications tower is reasonable in conjunction with the existing utility facility. Um, thus, we are recommending approval uh, with the specific conditions of development um, that I overviewed in the previous slide. Um, so at this time, I would like to request a motion. Okay, we need a motion. So moved. Thank you. Thank you. Wait a second. <clears throat> Who's the second on that? 
Lou? Lou, okay. Discussion, anyone? Yeah, I have one question. This is Bill. Um, as we're, uh, I guess, in a position to only approve this, uh, this particular uh, one does not meet the setback, so it goes before the uh, zoning um, committee. Okay. Correct. The board of zoning adjustment. Yeah. Board of yeah zoning adjustment. Um, my question is, are they also uh, committed to the the um, cell tower act or whatever? So, so basically, to they're going to have to say yes to it. That's my question. So, at the board of zoning adjustment. You're only coming to the board truly if your property has some unique um, aspect or some an unusual hardship that's keeping you from meeting the the prescribed regulation in the zoning ordinance. So the tower company will have to convince the board that there is no way for them to meet the setback. Um, but in terms of the interplay of the 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 two you know the two telecom acts, um, the 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 legislation still applies, but it's a little bit different as there to go to the board. You basically have to, um, you know, it's voluntary. No one makes you go to the board. You know, if they if if the board didn't grant their variance, they're only um, option I suppose would be to reduce the height of the tower. Okay. So they're they're not committed to follow that act. All all boards of St. Louis County and all local and, and all local jurisdictions, they do have to take the state statute as it is as it was um you know, put forward by by the state of Missouri, um, all local jur jurisdictions have to meet that. Now, how that plays out exactly in each sort of case is a case by case sort of basis. So, the board of zoning adjustment does take is subject to um, is subject to all statutes of the state of Missouri. Well, you know, they are looking at these actions from a different perspective and a different purview than the planning commission. Yeah, um, I understand I'm more that. limited in but scope. Um, my question is. <laughs> Do they have the latitude not to approve it? That's my question. I understand they, well, what you're saying. Sure. So they receive, they receive very, I'm not going to say very similar. They receive essentially the exact same sort of legal advice when it comes to these sorts of towers. They hear the same, they hear the same legal advice that the planning commission receives from the county counselor's office. So, um, Again, though, they are looking at it from a slightly different perspective and a slightly different angle. So the, the way that the, the county counselor's office, you know, recommends that the codes be applied um, is slightly different, but they're hearing the same. They're essentially hearing the same uh, legal advice that this commission. Has. I think I think I got my answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I have a question. <clears throat> was there was there a interference analysis or intermod study at all done to show that this tower won't um, affect the nearby towers that the public mentioned that was uh, nearby? So not that we require of them, but that's something that we anticipate the tower company does during their site selection. But it's not something they're required nor to demonstrate to us, nor that we can require them to to show us. Got it. Anyone but, else? And then they have, you know, all the FFA for being so high, they have to meet those other federal rules, um, which I think sort of is where some of that interference uh, analysis comes into play. Okay, seeing no one else, we have a motion to approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Eyes have it eight zero. Um, we have one correspondence item. PC thirty one eighty three. 
EC 3183, Ronnie's Enterprises requested an amendment to C8 Ordinance 11 or 72 as amended for a 25.6 acre track located on the south, north side of Lindbergh Boulevard and west, of, uh, west side of uh, Baptist Church Road in South County. In the area, the, the dashed line shows the C8 district and the solid red line outlined the subject portion of the site. From this area, uh, you can see that the site is located within a commercial cluster and it is predominantly surrounded by residential users. This is the preliminary site development plan, which shows uh, a building of approximately 2,600 square feet and one drive through lane. The commission may recall that last year, the Seven Brew coffee shop wanted to occupy the site and presented the site development plan showing a proposed drive through only coffee shop with two drive through lanes. Uh, the current request is to expand the building size from 1,000 square feet to 2,600 square feet for a proposed uh, Starbucks, Starbucks coffee shop. The architectural elevations are not the finalized versions, uh, but, they are, but they provide a general idea of the building design given by the Starbucks. The department approves this request as, as it is reasonable expansion of the permitted users at the site and also it is compatible with the other users of the area. Okay. <clears throat> we need a motion. motion to accept the or to accept to approve that. <laughs> Do we have a second? A second. Discussion. Uh, do they have direct uh, at drive access to Lindbergh? But from the drawing, it's pretty small, so I, I can't determine it. They do not. So you could come in Ronnie's Plaza, the curb cut you see here, um, or just off the screen to the left. There's another curb cut. I think that's the one that's much closer to the TGI Fridays, but there's no new curb cut proposed uh, on Lindbergh. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Seeing on all those in favor? No. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it 8 0. Uh, no site plans? No site plans. Okay, for the good of the order. So the commission may recall earlier this year, um, staff had mentioned that we are able to sign the planning commission members up for an American Planning Association, the APA membership. So we have paid for you all to have an account created. Um, so what I'm gonna show you is what, what steps you'll have to take to, to access your account. Um, so the website that you go to is planning.org. So Abby, next slide, please. So this is what it looks like. Um, it's just planning.org, or if you Googled you know, American Planning Association, you'll come to their website. <clears throat> there's plenty of things that you can kind of snoop around and see without logging in, but to log in, there's a button up at the upper right. I will also send everyone an email with this link um, and these steps as well, but I just want to want you all to see it here. So you'll come to the website, you'll log in, and then on the next slide, you'll you'll put in your APA ID. So they have generated an ID number for each of you that I will send you. It's unique to you. So each of you will need to log in um, with your ID number and you'll likely have to set up your password for the first time. Uh, then once you're logged in, I think the main place that the commissioners are going to find the kind of, um, you know, uh, information that that's really valuable to you is in the knowledge center. So one of the tabs along the top where the arrow is right now is the knowledge center. And I've highlighted in red the two sort of areas where I think you'll find the most um, sort of beneficial information. There's all sorts of publications that the APA creates short, short, you know, little articles blog posts, all the way to the Journal of the American Planning Association, which is our sort of peer review, sort of, it is a peer reviewed um, journal. So um, I will send everyone, you know, the link, your APA ID, 
um, and, and the information to get started. But then I really, really encourage you all to just, you know, click around the website, um, see what's out there. Uh, and then also in the future, now that you all have logins, we'll be able to link you more directly to some of these APA resources um, as they're relevant to the work we bring before you, or just, you know, as we find things we think you uh, might be interested in. Uh, are there any questions about your APA <laughs> membership? Um, you know, I think you'll get into it a little bit more once you log in, but just looking kind of high level, I'm happy to answer any questions. Before anyone jumps in, I, I just want to say the department is excited to um, provide this to the commission. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, being members of the American Planning Association proves beneficial for um, each of you. Mel, almost, most of our staff are, are APA members. Mel and I, um, you know, we have AICP after our names. That means we're American Institute of Certified Planners. Uh, the American Planning Association is the, uh, is the entity that, that does that. And it is the professional organization um, for for planners and for those who are just interested in the planning process. So, um, like Mel said, there's a lot of I think really great uh, information on there, um, and it, it, we're just really hopeful that um, that it may prove beneficial um, for you all over time as you um, peruse it and find things of interest to read about. So, Thanks. appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Yeah, and if when when you log in, you know, I'm happy to, you know, give me a call. We can hop on a, you know, a video conference and walk through anything, anything you guys want. Thank you. The only other item is is our upcoming meeting. So um, I didn't put it on here, but in two weeks is the public hearing. Somehow I missed putting the May public hearing on here. So May 15th is the May public hearing here in the county administration building um, <clears throat> at seven o'clock. We have three petitions. I believe Evelyn sent out um, the documents. She did tell me that when she sent them out, she did not mean for it to use Mimecast when she sent the email. So if you're having any issues opening up the public hearing notice and the site plans that go with it, um, let me or Evelyn know because it's sent off a different way than, than she in intended. Um, but other than that, then we'll have our, our, our June meetings and executive meeting on the 5th, and then the public hearing will be the second week of June instead of the third, because the county will be closed for, for Juneteenth on the 19th of June. Okay. And with that, we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I have it eight zero, and we'll see you on the fifteenth. See you on the fifteenth, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good week.